It took me eight to 12 hours a day to get about 90% as good as Facebook after the first month. By the third or fourth month, the best I could do was 25 to 30% worse than Facebook. Hello and welcome to AG Speaks Digital Marketing Talk Show. Here we share with you cool tools, tips and tricks, and lots of useful information and insights to help you get more leads and customers for your business. Hello and welcome to AG Speak Digital Marketing Talk Show. And today we have a very exciting guest with us, Charlie T, the Facebook ad expert, guy who spent more than $250 million on ads on Facebook and this guy knows his stuff. So you got something to learn from him. I am super, super excited and super pumped to have him join us today. And I have a ton of questions to ask. And I'm sure you'll find this conversation insightful as well. So welcome to the show, Charlie. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is going to be fun. I always like discussing this topic with people. And yeah, I, I've spent a couple hundred million dollars over nearly a decade. My clients and students have driven over a billion dollars in revenue. I, I this, is, this is what I do. Uh, ever since I stopped being a radio DJ and touring musician, I got into advertising and well, here I am now at 10 years later and, and thank you so much for having me. Any chance I can have to help people see more success and less stress in their efforts, the better the world is. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. In fact, I was, uh, I, I was so taken aback that you readily agreed to join me on my podcast show today because I mean, there are good people willing to help you. That's why I mean, you're one of them. So here's my first question. The, the, the very important thing that I like to understand about people is what was, you know, their growing up years like and how did that impact in what they have become today? So can you tell me a little bit about your backstory? Sure. So um, both of my parents are computer scientists. Wow. So, and my dad, when he retired, decided to start teaching like theoretical mathematics for fun. So numbers and money and analysis is just in the blood. There's, I, I, there's no way I could have come at, I could have made a professional career where I don't use Excel. Like this just would never have possibly happened. Um, and as a kid, uh, I got accepted to Mensa when I was seven. Um, I still have a Mensa card in my wallet somewhere. Uh, every now and again, somebody asks to see it. That's, I keep it. Uh, and I was in the gifted and talented programs. And, you know, I was in the magnet schools and all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, then I had puberty and, uh, you know, I had some health issues and some other things. And so I was always a bit of an outcast because I was probably a bit smarter than the average person, but not nearly as good at the social skills as everybody else. Uh, and so I started, you know, some dark years there and eventually went to college and I went to college to be a recording engineer and, and make rock and roll records because um, I was a musician. Um, so I got my first degree in that. Um, then the music industry kind of went under because of Napster and bad musicians and everything else, or the version of the music industry that was very profitable. Their business model had to change because of democratized access to quality. I'll put it that way uh, to make things a little bit more PC. Uh, so I went back to school and I got a bachelor's degree in music business management, basically staying in the music business, but doing more contracts in, in business side of, of the music business. Instead of making records, why don't I be the person that writes the check for people that makes records? Um, I was a touring musician at the time. I was a radio DJ, talk shows and music shows. And eventually um, I was able to put myself through graduate school. So I got my third college degree, a master's in business administration and marketing. Because uh, when you're a touring musician, you learn how to come home with money in your pocket. And I basically just learned how to do that for everybody else. Basically, uh, I had a radio show. My little radio show ended up being the most popular on the station. I went from a college radio to regular FM radio to Sirius XM satellite radio worldwide um, in a matter of a few years, just because I was really good at promoting myself. People would ask me to promote them. Eventually, they would turn that promotion into making money. So I was making money for people. They paid me money, got through grad school, all sorts of fun stuff happened. Then the radio station I was at, um, put it politely, there was a scandal with a sex tape and a professional wrestler. And the radio station went, went under 
Uh, they they went out of business and I had to go find a job. And I moved from Florida to Los Angeles uh, and got my first job at an ad agency. Um, that was like a decade ago. But as a young kid, um, every year I played Little League Baseball. We did fundraisers where we're selling candy, stuff like that. Every year I set a new record for the most amount of candy sold. Because uh, the winner, whoever sold the most candy got a free like gift card to Toys R Us. So I got a new bike every year because I sold more candy than any other kid. And so every year for like seven years, I was the number one salesman kid for candy bars in, in Northern Virginia. Uh, and so it's just been in my blood basically ever since. The, being a very good salesman, having data science and math uh, as a background and uh, being, you know, having the love, having the, the grace to have a, a bit higher IQ than a lot of other people being able to learn really fast. I, I've paid in other ways where I'm not nearly as good socially with people sometimes. Uh, and ultimately what that's done is it made me exceptionally strong at being able to understand trends and make money. Um, and when digital marketing became a thing, when Facebook ads were basically invented, um, that became a very easy way for me to take my very particular skill set and um, create a career um, where I'm now one of the recognized as one of the top 100 people in America uh, for doing ads. And to be honest, half of those other people are my students. So, uh, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've been blessed in some opportunities and I've been lucky enough to take advantage of the ones that came my way. I think that because of some of the struggles I had in my teenage years, um, I also have a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And I think be most very successful entrepreneurs have a desire that pushes them above and beyond the average person. Um, there has to be something innately that's driving you. Um, and for me, being a bit of a social outcast, having a bit of some issues, um, that is the, like the thing that talks to me in the middle of the night or when I wake up in the morning that is a bit uncomfortable, but also is great fuel um, so that I can create more and do more things. And ultimately is why now I try to devote the majority of my time um, to helping people be successful because nobody was there when I started because we were literally writing the playbook when I when I started it, when I started in Facebook ads. And the fact that I was a bit of an outcast and the fact that I was a little bit you know, separate from most people now drives me to want to not only wake up and be successful, but also to define that success, not only by paying my bills, but by also helping other people not be alone and not struggle. And I mean, my focus this year more than anything is I want to create, I want to help create a thousand jobs from the people of my students from my Facebook ads MBA program, folks come to my webinars, folks that see me speak in person, follow me on social media. If I can help business owners see more confidence and better success. And that allows them to provide opportunity to other people. That is the greatest gift I could receive. And so that's sort of my, like, I get up in the morning to give people an opportunity that I never had. Um, but that's sort of the full circle of where I came from to what kind of brings me here today. Interesting. Uh, super cool. In fact, I have a similar ambition where, you know, I was struggling through my why for, for a long time. Um, and, and of course, money is important, right? So you start determining your success with how much money you're making because you believe that's sure. how much value the world is willing to put on you, right? Uh, and now I changed my game where I said, okay, whatever it is that I know, whatever it is that I bring to this world, I want to be able to help people. So from the day I've changed my mindset, so this year I've set a goal that I want to impact the lives of 100,000 people because money will happen. If I'm adding value, if I'm making a difference to people's life, money should happen automatically. Uh, and, and one lady actually put this thought into me where she said money follows purpose, right? So once you have a purpose mm -hmm. defined, the money will follow. So, so that's a very interesting point you make that every day you get up in the morning, uh, because you want to help that entrepreneur who might be struggling, not go through the struggle that you had gone through. So that's that's a really noble and a beautiful way of looking at business. Uh, so coming to my next question, uh, when you well, I, I will, I, I appreciate that. I, I will, I will say, I will say one thing, and I do appreciate that. It's also terribly selfish because I just want to be happy, and seeing other people <laughs> be successful is what makes exactly. me feel good. Yes. Um. So while it sounds great. I'm a terribly selfish person. I just want to <laughs> put my head on the pillow at night feeling good. Yeah. And yeah, what yeah. the way I've found to do that is be helpful to others. So while it sounds altruistic, I want to call myself out. I'm a terribly selfish person, just wants yeah. to be happy. And what yeah. makes me happy is the success of others. 
Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I, I hear you completely. A lot of where I came from was just raising my hand when somebody said, who wants to try something? Because nobody knows what to do. <laughs> I was willing to be uncomfortable. I was willing to do that thing that scared me every day, right? <laughs> I was, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I was willing to take that risk mm. because I kind of felt like that's exciting. And I'd rather be uncomfortable and grow than to sit here all day. And I got a, I got a job working at um, an e-commerce business that was really good at Google, but they wanted to set up Facebook ads. And so I got a three month contract with them to basically take their brand of hair care products and supplements and basically make it, how do we make, how do we sell this stuff on social media? Um, and so I spent about three months setting that up mm -hmm. um, to the point where it was completely automated and they didn't need me. And it was great. And then I got a job from there working at another ad agency, but what we call an FMP, a Facebook marketing partner. Mm -hmm. And that one, basically, they had a technology that sat on Facebook, automated all of your ads for you, stuff like that. And I had a job there for a while um, as basically I was senior ads. And um, my job more or less was one to, you know, run money and do things like I was managing everything from Pizza Hut to progressive insurance. I was running Disney and MGM hotels. Uh, I got to bring the TRX like workout equipment to market. So like I launched that brand with them. Um, and, but primarily my job was to go in and say, you as a business might have two or three agencies you're working with. Maybe you got a Google agency, a Facebook agency, a web design agency, maybe a creative, whatever. And I would go in and basically say, I, my job is basically to take the money from the other company. I was like, well, you don't need them. We can do it. And so I got really, really good at proving the results that I had. And then also proving that what we could do is better than what somebody else could do. And so I started to just steal business from other companies a lot. And so that was basically my job is, hey, this client wants to spend 50,000 a month. By the time I was done with them, they might be spending half a million a month because we just basically stole all of their budget from everybody else because the agency did Facebook, they did Google, they did web design, they did creative, they did all of that. So when I stole one or two, it was really easy to sell the fourth one. Hey, we'll do a package deal. We'll do it cheaper. We all work together. Everything will be cohesive, all of that stuff. And I worked for one or two other agencies. I started my own agency once or twice, kind of by accident even sometimes. And, and then I eventually left that because somebody that was running a, a, a startup, they were maybe two, three years into it, um, wanted to have like an elite person. And so I joined, I went from agency side to client side. I see. Um, and that company is called 310 Nutrition. It's a mm -hmm. meal replacement shake, not weight loss because we're running mm -hmm. Facebook ads. It's not a weight loss brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went in there as the second Facebook person. Mm -hmm. Like they had two. Mm -hmm. After a week of me being there, the other person put in their notice and left. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, working at that company for almost two years, we took them from about 15, 20 million to about 95 million. Mm -hmm. um, we took their ad spend from 3000 a day to 20 or 30,000 a day. So 8,000 to 20 or 30, mm -hmm. um, and just did a lot of things. And that's where I got into the Facebook disruptor group, mm -hmm. um, which is the top hundred advertisers. Cause I already had a reputation for testing. All of the people that were now heading departments knew me when they were coming up because I was the guy running all of their tests. Now they were in management positions and they wanted to reach out to somebody they could trust Hey, I've known this guy for five years. We'll just work with him, you know? And so I ended up working on a few more brands like that. Um, a couple SaaS companies, a couple other things. And ultimately during that, I started getting to teaching because um, I realized that when I would go to Facebook groups to ask for help, because when you're at an agency, there's 20 people that you can talk to, right? Yeah. And I knew I was probably better than most of the people at the agency because I was a senior person. I was, I was management. Like I should be better than the other people. I was teaching them all the time. But when I left the agency, I didn't have anybody to talk to anymore. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Facebook groups like Cat Howell's group or ad leaks or, you know, any of these other big things. And what I realized in very short amount of time was I was a lot better than everybody else. And so I spent my time helping other people and answering questions. And 
slowly I kept getting kicked out of every Facebook group because I was undermining the person that ran that group and I was bad for business. <laughs> um, and eventually what happened is a couple people convinced me to start my own Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And now it's about almost 13,000 people. One of those guys that convinced me to do it has been a student of mine and a colleague for many years. He's now the chief marketing officer. He's the CMO of Triple Whale, a uh, great attribution software, a really good guy. His name's Raba. Mm -hmm. um, he was like, man, I can't, you're in like 20 groups. Just make your own. Mm -hmm. And eventually I got asked the same question so many times. I wrote down the answers, started doing eBooks. And mm -hmm. instead of selling them one off, I just had a Patreon. And mm -hmm. it was like, hey, for five bucks, 10 mm -hmm. bucks, 20 bucks, you can have access to all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, after two or three years of doing that, that Patreon got to be a five figure monthly income. Wow. Like I was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year just from the Patreon. Wow. Okay. Um, and then I got some consulting clients mm -hmm. and I started accidentally started another ad agency at, at my desk inside of this other company, 310 Nutrition, because I'm only working a couple hours a day. I mean, I was you know, re responsible for whatever, but like when you use Facebook, right, it should be a couple hours a week. So I had to look busy. And so I was helping other people and people were like, hey, you're really good. Can I just pay you? So I ended up basically being a freelancer with like five or six clients farming out creative work. I, I, I accidentally started another agency. It just keeps happening. And so eventually what happened is COVID happened. So we stopped going into the office and I started just making more and more money doing that and helping more and more people. So I started training ad agencies how to get good. And... Uh, what I realized from that was I was training ad agencies to get better and better at acquiring customers, but they weren't doing better and better at training and, and paying employees. And most of the ad agencies I worked with poorly trained, underqualified people that they didn't pay enough and they overworked them. And they relied on their salesperson to just continue to grow the business. And at that point, I just kind of threw my hands up. And I was like, I'm going to take what I do to the businesses and entrepreneurs that want to succeed. And so that's where like my Facebook ads MBA program comes from, like a decade of doing all this stuff with seven, eight, nine figure businesses, all the lessons I've learned from people. And now I have the pleasure of helping dozens of people around the world, um, you know, create massive change. And it really was this organic thing of like, I got fired from that agency nine years ago. And so I brought one of their clients with me who was unhappy with them anyway. And I was just like, I was kind of angry. I was like, I just had this great job. You fired me. Screw it. I'm bringing this person with me. And they were like, you, we'll charge. I told them I'll charge you half and you'll get me full time. And they loved it. And ever since then, me working for myself always paid as good or better than working for other people. Interesting. And it got to the point where I couldn't say no to people and I couldn't get other people to say no to me. And now, you know, a decade later, I've gotten a reputation for what I do, good or bad. And um, I've been able to make real change for people. And now I, you know, Try to just team? make the world a bit a, of a better place. You have a team of people with you or do you do it alone or solo? I do or? it all by myself. No, that's, I have one assistant mm -hmm. who reposts content for me mm -hmm. and will sometimes answer some questions for me. Mm -hmm. um, like if my, uh, if my like accountant has things, my buddy will be like, hey, look, you need to speak to this. Like he'll kind of, he's my assistant, um, mm -hmm. but it's all me. Well, I how? mean, wow. so, so, I mean, you, so you're one it. of those, you're one of those uh, uh, solopreneurs who are the million millionaire solopreneurs, is it? <laughs> Something like that, you know, Something I mean, like that. yeah, at the end of the day, I just do what I'm passionate about. That's right. And I've leaned into what I'm really good at. Right. And more than anything, it's three things. One, I mean, I know Facebook ads better than most people. I, I, I it has been a long time since I've been in rooms with a lot of other people that I, that I, where I ended up not being the center, not teaching everybody else to put it politely. Right. Um, and I'm also really good at teaching and explaining very big concepts, hopefully in a very simple way. Simple. And that comes from years and years of answering questions. Like I spent an hour or two every day for the last five or six years helping people mm. and having to get all of it into a comment section mm. or a reply on Twitter. Like you got, you got 15 seconds for a video on YouTube, whatever, like you, you got to make it condensed and make it yeah. simple enough for people to get. Mm -hmm. And then also because I was working with, you know, people running seven, eight, nine figure businesses, they didn't care 
So I had to explain to them very complex things in a way that they would understand so that they understood what I was doing. And because like if you're running a, a hundred million dollar business, ultimately you don't really care about the day-to-day -day work of your Facebook yeah. marketer. Yeah, yeah. But when they say, hey, what are you doing for me? I had to give them an answer in 30 seconds or less that made them feel like this guy's good. Let's go find somebody else to talk to. Uh, and so I got really, really good at that. And then the last thing is, um, I think I can make content. I can speak clearly uh, mm -hmm. at a brick wall for hours and hours and hours and hours. <laughs> but I was a radio DJ for a long, long time. Nice. So yeah. I can talk forever and I can create content really fast. Mm -hmm. Like today, for instance, I'm going to probably make 11 Facebook or Instagram reels. Um, so I'm making 11 today wow. um, and I'm writing an article and I've been on three consulting calls and in this interview. Plus I had lunch and I worked out and I walked my dogs and had some coffee and slept in. Like for me, this is just every day. So it's like when you find the things you're passionate about and you can create change and good, if you lean into that, it's really hard to not be happy. Right. Super. I'm, I'm feeling actually I can feel the energy vibe passing on to me and I can I can actually relate to what you're saying because uh, you are uh, you're 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 giving me a lot of positive vibes right now it's it's a lot of positive oh well energy. thank you yeah it's, it's a lot of energy energy of doing what you really love doing uh you know and and that kind of radiates so here's my here's my uh you know next question what do you think now since you are uh, a facebook ads expert what do you think has changed about facebook from you know just a few years ago to now in terms of ads because facebook keeps changing right and and with ios making the changes and with even google privacy you know making the changes what do you think is changing about facebook ads and what should be the right strategy now for doing facebook in the current time yeah that's a great question i'll say this i i think we've had three major really two major changes mm -hmm. um in facebook ads i'll say three fine three major changes since i started number one was the facebook pixel mm -hmm. like the idea that you could run a conversion campaign that you didn't need to run facebook like a paper like google that was a massive shift the next big change was the power five the introduction of dynamic ads and advanced matching and CBO and all of that. Um, the power of broad and, and all of those things. Um, and then I think the biggest other shift was obviously iOS 14 was, was a big shift too. Um, I will say this. I think the conversion objective made a big change because it changed how you could use the tool. You didn't have to use the tool to drive traffic and then try to make the best of it. Then we had the power five come along, which is dynamic ads, advanced matching, CBO. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a couple other more technical things in there, but just the best practices. And that was a fundamental shift because it meant that we could now use more and more information. So we didn't have to hack the machine. The machine learning was getting really, really smart. And ultimately Facebook every day got a little bit smarter and a little bit better at doing all of the work for us. So it tremendously reduced the workload of the average advertiser. Before uh, Power 5, I might have 12, 15 campaigns, 20, 30 ad sets, 100 ads. After Power 5, the majority of my most successful clients and brands that I manage, I'm also now equity in some brands, I'm running a couple myself, um, we might have at max three campaign, um, and it's almost fully automated. Uh, like I'm not doing much work. Uh, I have a clothing brand, for instance, we went from 5,000 a day to 20,000 a day in the last four months. I legitimately spend two hours a week on it. Nice. Um, and so it's really empowered you to not have to do that. Right. And then I think iOS 14 was incredibly disruptive because a lot of people relied on trying to be smarter than the machine and working really hard and making things really complex and relying on their intellect and intuition and work ethic to win, which nothing wrong with that. But with iOS 14, the biggest implication of it is Facebook gave us the roadmap in 2018 of what we're supposed to do. If you're not doing that, it is harder and harder to win after iOS 14. Because what Facebook, when they taught us in 2018, it's relying mostly on the information that Facebook has already. Nothing that iOS 14 could ever do. I mean, to be fair, 
the average person in America, for instance, has it's an adult, has had a Facebook account for maybe 10 years. That Facebook pixel has been on the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds or millions of websites that you've been on over that entire 10 years. They've seen every action you've taken on those sites. They know how long you've been there. They know what words you're using in WhatsApp and on Messenger. They know what content you're clicking on, what you like to watch, what you like to engage with, who you're talking to, what type of ads you respond to, what type of content you want to see on Facebook as well as on Instagram. And so they're very, very good at making sure that the average person sees content that they like. And ultimately, our job is to make sure that we are doing that as much as we can, creating content people want to see, and then ultimately making sure that that content also delivers a desired business result. If you're fighting that, iOS 14 has made it harder and harder for you to be successful. That's right. So moving forward, the playbook from 2018 is only more and more important. Um, and it's really simple. Um, I use dynamic ads to test creatives. I then use broad targeting everywhere. And I use CBO on everything. Um, I use automated rules to push and pull budgets, turn ads on and off. Right. Um, I'm actually made 10 reels today about automated rules. So I posted one right before this and there's going to be another nine to go afterwards. Okay. Uh, and then it'll be posted on my YouTube and all sorts of fun stuff and TikTok and Pinterest and Twitter. And like it, I repurpose content also, which yep, makes me look yep. really busy, but <laughs> it doesn't take that much work. Yeah. Um, and, and so really, if you're using dynamic ads to, to validate ad concepts um, and then extracting the post ID for your best ad and putting it with winners, and then ultimately all you're trying to do is test your creative to get a more efficient ad at a current sales pitch or angle that works, how do I reach this person but better? Or how do I reach somebody else with a different type of ad? The way that we've been taught about audiences and all of that stuff is really just about what your content looks like. Some people will watch videos. Some people will never watch a video. My mom will never watch a video on Facebook unless it's about me, my wife, or my dogs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, she's never going to sit there and watch videos. But my dad, for instance, will watch videos all day long, but never looks at a picture. I'm a little bit of both, but I'm also a big nerd when it comes to ads. So whenever I see content, I'm always diving into it. Um, but everybody behaves differently. So Facebook's really, really good because it has literally billions of data points to understand what you want to see today. And so if you lean into that, where your primary objective is either to make a sales pitch more efficient or reach a new type of person, either increase your efficiency or increase your scale. And then all you're doing, you know, they say uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So when you get a new really good ad, all you need to do is replace the worst ad that you have with something that's better. And what that means is you're constantly getting a little bit better every week, a little bit better every couple of weeks, a little bit better every couple of months. And if you can get 2% better every week, you're going to be 300% better at the end of the year. And so all you have to do is really focus on that. And that gives you days of the week to work on everything that happens after the click. And I think the most important thing to remember is a good business model will scale a Facebook account, but it's extremely difficult for a Facebook ad account to scale a business um, because you have to be good at what happens afterwards. And ultimately, I hear you. I hear you. what matters the most now is the data. If you're really good at understanding how to make decisions, then you're going to be, you're going to, if you, all you need to do is help Facebook make better and better decisions by making sure that you're improving the quality of decision it can make. It honestly comes down to that. And then you let it do everything else. Great. So, so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, actually. Uh, like you don't have to meddle too much with the machine. The machine knows what uh, you know, it's supposed to do. Uh, and so yeah. your job is to create great content. And, you know, the, the machine will figure out uh, who to show your content to and how, what will work best in your interest. So so don't meddle with it too much. Let it do its job. Yeah. That's that's ultimately what I hear you say. Uh, yeah, I, I'll say this just to wrap it up on that point. Um, Facebook works hard so that you don't have to. Facebook yeah. is the thing that's working hard. You're yeah. the manager. Yeah. And if you've ever had a job where your manager micromanaged and told you what to do every 20 <laughs> minutes, you're not going to be very good at that job. Yeah, true. true. So you can't I, I, possibly expect Facebook to be good when you're changing your mind every 30 minutes. True, true, true. So okay. just invest in it like an employee and you'll be know. pretty good. One more question that's coming to mind is that, you know, when I started learning about marketing, you know, you 
learned the concept of <clears throat> the the funnel, right? The awareness, yeah. consideration, and and the purchase, and and finally the conversion. Uh, and and what I wanted to hear from you was, as a Facebook ad expert, is it a good idea to run conversion campaigns, which is the bottom of the funnel campaign, right, to a cold audience? Do you think Facebook is good at doing that for you? Or should you first be building a warm audience through a reach campaign and then through some amount of, you know, nurturing campaigns and then run conversion campaigns? What's your thought on that? Um, I run conversion campaigns almost exclusively. Um, I don't run awareness campaigns. I don't run traffic campaigns. I don't run reach. Okay. And here's why. Mm -hmm. There's no way for you to know. No two customers behave the same. Okay. And very few products, if any, are so innovative that nobody knows what it is. So there's an element of Facebook, the power five, which is called advanced matching. Mm -hmm. Now, advanced matching means, remember I said Facebook knows all the other websites you've been on and That's all the right. other people's ads you've clicked on. That's right. Even with iOS 14, Facebook knows, oh, you clicked on an ad from Adidas and from Nike and mm -hmm. from New Balance, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, hopefully New Balance. I mean, I used to run New Balance, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw <laughs> them in there. Uh, I used to run their ads, not the business, the ads. Big yeah. difference. I want to call that out because I, I <laughs> almost misspoke. I did not run the New Balance brand. I ran their ad account. Um, but what we, but what it means is Facebook knows you're in the market for shoes. So you're already in consideration. You're already aware. You know, I want shoes. Maybe I want red sneakers. Well, Facebook knows you want red sneakers because you're constantly clicking on ads for red sneakers. Maybe you're showing up on websites. Maybe that's the product that you've added to cart a few times, whatever else. You already have awareness. You already have consideration. So my ad of my brand's red trainers, maybe let's just say I'm running, I don't know, Puma. All right, we didn't name that before, so we're a competitor. Uh, say I'm running, or I'll say Converse. I'm a big Chuck Taylors fan, so Converse. Yeah. If I have Converse and I know, and, and the system knows that you've added to cart and abandoned on Nike, New Balance, Reebok, Vans, and, and, and whatever else, my ad to you is a retargeting ad, even if it's cold traffic. I see. So we have to stop thinking of cold traffic and the idea that people don't know what this is. Unless you have some innovative product that nobody's ever heard of before, very rarely is any traffic cold. Okay. Like say you're running a pizza joint. Like I used to run Pizza Hut stuff. I also, for whatever it's worth, I used to run Papa John's. I did it at the same time. Big conflict of interest, but I was getting a paycheck. I didn't care. Um, pizza isn't new, right? If you want pizza, like I don't have to tell you about awareness or engagement or whatever. Most of the time people are clicking on that ad, not because you're telling that something exists, but because they're interested in it for whatever journey has gotten them to that point. And so as a, for instance, going back to what we're talking about, about the, about the uh, test drives. Now, the reason that work wasn't because test drives sell cars, which, Hey, look, test drives do sell cars, but a test drive in a car is the very bottom of the funnel, right? Like, You've, you have friends that have told you about cars they have. You've driven a few cars maybe in your life. You've seen billboards and TV commercials. By the time you actually decide to get into a test drive of a specific vehicle, you've pretty much already made the decision, I'm going to buy, I'm going to rent a car or lease a vehicle or buy something today. You're already there. So every ad is a retargeting ad. And I know that it's also a retargeting ad for some other reason. Because remember we said Facebook knows all the content you're engaging with. Facebook also knows the content you want to see. Mm -hmm. Very few people want to see something new that they've never engaged with. So I'm only going to see content that's sort of a mirror of who I am. So by the time some brand new brand shows me some ad for some product that I didn't know about, it's a version of something I've shown a lot of intent with and a lot of interest in. So the idea of consideration and awareness and engagement and reach, your conversion campaigns are doing that for you. The big difference is a conversion campaign is only going to show ads to somebody who's likely to buy. Now, maybe I'm somebody that's likely to buy, but you're somebody that just wants to go shopping and you try on every shoe, even though you don't even have any intention of buying it, yeah. right? Maybe my, my wife is this kind of person. She'll go and test drive five cars. Never going to get in, but she's like, oh, I got nothing to do. I'm going to go test drive a car. Like, okay, cool. Whatever. Like you get in the Jeep, you get in the Mercedes Benz, whatever. You enjoy life. That's a, that's a hobby, right? It's a fun thing to do. Facebook knows she's not in the market because she has a very long history 
of not okay. actually showing intent. Yeah. So I only want to spend my money on the people who are likely to maybe take an action. Mm. So most of the waste that we have isn't actually that our ads are bad. It's that we're showing them to people who aren't interested. Mm. And so if you run a, if you run a brand awareness campaign and then a video view campaign and then an engagement campaign and then a traffic, and then you only retarget those people. Mm. Yes. Those people are going to be interested. Yes. That works. Mm. But you have to, in order for you to be profitable, that conversion campaign that might get you a great ROAS or CPA has to also pay off every penny it took to get somebody to that point. So maybe you can get a 10X ROAS on $100 spent, but if it costs you over $1,000 to get that person there, you lost money. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood that that person at step one that you reached is also that person at the very bottom is very low, right? So these funnels, the reason they get smaller and smaller is because there's less and less people. Mm -hmm. So knowing that every ad is already a retargeting ad and knowing that Facebook knows who wants to take whatever action, the lead gen, the event you're promoting, the product you're trying to sell, whatever it is, all you're doing is saying, well, you already know who's interested. Let me just, you show them my ad also. Mm -hmm. And you're going to win because your ad is more engaging. Yeah. Or is something that people want to see because ultimately your ad is a burden on somebody else's life, mm. right? We're ultimately trying to monetize bothering people <laughs> as one way of looking at it, right? Like nobody goes into their Instagram to see ads. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people, I, I, I will sometimes like I'll, I'll, I'll try things just like, but I'm a nerd. I'm an ad person. Yeah, this no, is what I no. do. I think most people don't sign into their Facebook because they want to see ads. That's true. So your ad, like a commercial on a television show, is a burden. They would do anything in the world to not have to see it. So when you bother people, you have to respect that what is their experience. And if you start to consider that person's interaction with your content is something more than just, are they going to pull out the credit card and give me money? Then you can do a lot better. Um, and I think that's the big mental shift that most people have to make. And to be honest, the last two big seismic shifts we've seen with Facebook, the people that didn't make that shift within a year, they were experts at something else. Um, now everybody is an expert in TikTok because they can't make Facebook work. Well, what they're doing on TikTok is also wrong because TikTok is just a simple version of Facebook. Um, and so they're just trying to, you know, do whatever else. And so you see people be experts in email and then they're experts in blogging and then they're experts in organic social and then they're experts in Facebook. And then they're, they're trying the same bad idea, but because the attention is so cheap, they can at least make money for a short period of time. But ultimately I'm not interested in short period of time. I want to build empires. I want to build brands that create money so that, you know, you can sell the business, you can retire, you can hire people. And you're never okay, going to so, get there by trying to hack your way to the top. Right. So the super insightful. What I what I uh, correct me if I've heard you uh, you know understood your your concept, and that is that you people who are spending and wasting money on reach and you know the consideration set of ads is actually a waste of uh, money because uh, ultimately Facebook already has that data about what people are likely to be interested in, what their intent is going to be, what their lifestyle is like. Uh, and, and so it is better for you to spend your money on running conversion campaigns to a broad audience, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that that would be a better return on investment of your money because Facebook will then be able to reach out to the right set of people because it knows who's interested in what. Uh, and if you go with a broader audience definition, that's going to work in your favor because with that broad audience, Facebook will know your content is going to be suitable for which person. And Facebook will do that job. And ultimately, uh, once you, derive, you know, drive the desired action, which is conversion, it is good for your business as well. Is that what you, what, what you... Yeah, I think that's really well put. And I'll okay. even go further and just say one thing. If you use interest groups mm -hmm. or retargeting audiences mm -hmm. or lookalikes, mm -hmm. this is happening in them anyway. All you're doing is you're paying extra to prevent some good people from seeing your ad. Yeah. Because this is how Facebook works anyway. Mm. So everyone in an interest group, a local like a retargeting audience, they're more expensive than broad. Mm. So you're paying basically, you're paying a tax to mm. get a worse result. <laughs> this, this is a big mind shift because believe me, I myself used to think very differently about this whole uh, uh, way of looking at things. And, and this will make me think. This will make me think about how I run my ads. Well, I love that. And I'll be honest, I used to think the same way too. 
Yeah, yeah. I had, uh, it took me about six months for Facebook to change my mind. Mm -hmm. And what we did was a $10 million ad spend, basically competition on mm -hmm. launching a new brand. 5 million Facebook's way, 5 million my way. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the long story short because mm -hmm. Lord knows I can talk all day long. Mm -hmm. It took me eight to 12 hours a day to get about 90% as good as Facebook after the first month. By the third or fourth month, the best I could do was 25 to 30% worse than Facebook. Facebook was running broad. Mm -hmm. I had a million audiences. It required me to do more and more work just to try to stay where I was. Whereas the other side just kept taking off and I fought it tooth and nail. I was convinced if I worked hard enough, I could beat it. And after a couple of months, I had to kind of give up. Like I fought it after I gave up, I still tried. Uh, Cause I was like, I didn't want my, I didn't want to lose my pride. You know, I'm, you know, whatever. I have an, e I have an ego. I'm a person, right? I didn't want to be wrong. Um, and the harder and harder I tried, the further and further behind I got. And mm -hmm. it fundamentally changed the way I think and the way that I approach it. And that was 2017, 2018. And yeah, like it took me about a year from the start of that test to the end for me to really fully understand everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and We've been teaching people that since then, um, I think it's only now kind of cracking through that people know the term broad. Like when I was talking about broad three years ago, nobody had any idea what I was talking about. Yeah. And now you hear it as like, does broad really work? Yeah. And in two years, people are going to be like, is, is MER really valuable? Which, is, mm -hmm. which it isn't. Um, and that's a whole other conversation for another day. But that's okay, right? Like, if I can go out there and make $10 million of a mistake so that three years later, four years later, somebody never has to, and that means they get to achieve their dreams and provide for their family and give up their day job and hire people, that's awesome. I used to be very resentful, but now I'm very happy. There's one last question that I want to ask, uh, and we can wrap up this conversation with that because I don't sure. want to take up more of your time. So the last question is that, you know, when I talk to a lot of clients and, and I've tried to reach out to a lot of B2B companies, and, and this is a common theme that I hear that B2B, we are in B2B, so LinkedIn makes a better sense for us and Facebook ads are not for us. And I, I try my best to tell them that, look, you are ultimately human to human. It's, it's the people, right? There is a mindset where people, the B2B companies uh, tend to think that Facebook is not for them. Uh, what is your take on that? What do you what do you have to say to them? And do you hear uh, this as well? Yeah, I hear it all the time. I used to run a lot of LinkedIn ads. I still have occasionally. Um, I'll say this very much like what you're saying. People are everywhere. Yeah. You just need to be where that person is. Yeah. LinkedIn as an ads platform is extraordinarily expensive. That's true. So my question to you is, you might get a uh, 5% conversion rate. One out of 20 people that sees your ad buys. That's awesome. Now, if it takes you $100 to reach 1,000 people, great. If I can reach 1,000 people for 15 bucks or $10, I could get one out of 100 people to purchase and I'll beat you all day long. This, the, the economy, what they call economy of scale, basically, I can fail far more than you if I can fail cheaper. Mm. And at the end of the day, I would much rather lose. I would much rather reach 10,000, 100,000 people, because I also know what that means is I'm likely to get transactions that occur not just from the ad. Mm. If you have to spend $100 to reach 1,000 people and I can spend $100, I get to reach 10,000. Maybe we both get one sale, but which one of us is more likely to get two or three other people kind of interested? Probably me, because I have 9,000 other people that may or may not be interested. All I need is one or two of them to talk to somebody else or to be mildly there. And so that idea of scale is one of the reasons why Facebook is still the greatest intent creation device available. Um, for what it's worth, TikTok is cheaper um, but it's not, it, you can't spend nearly as much money. Um, it, it, it won't fill that gap in the same way. Um, LinkedIn is extremely expensive to market to people. So if you think that you are a B2B business 
So you should only go to where business people are talking. My, my response to that is that might work, but would you, how many, if I can fail 10 times as often as you, the likelihood of me winning in the long run is a lot higher. Um, because at the end of the day, no marketing effort exists in a vacuum, right? You might see an ad, never click on it, but go Google something or go directly to the site. I, I've worked with a lot of B2B businesses where that person just went straight. They never clicked on the ad. They never did anything, but they saw things enough times and heard things from enough people. They just went to the site and checked it out. So our SEO person gets credit for organic, which, hey, they probably helped. Absolutely. But it's everybody working together that makes that work. If I can give you a 10 times better chance of making that work with a team, you have to be so good at LinkedIn just to compete, just to be almost as good as me. And I'll take those odds any day. I would rather empower an entire team than try to say, I'm so good at something that's so hard that you should pay me instead. Um, so in that way, I... I have used Facebook ads for literally every type of business I could imagine. And there is a way to make it work. Um, it's just about figuring out what is the most effective thing to ask Facebook to do. Mm. Um, and when you can figure that out, then mm. like, what is your core competency, right? Maybe your best skill is if you get somebody on the phone, you're going to close the deal. So Facebook's job isn't to close the deal. Facebook's job is to get more people on the phone. And then eventually when there's too many phone calls, we need to get higher quality people on the phone. Like, can you handle 20 a day? Great, I'm gonna give you 20 of the best possible people. That's what Facebook should be used for, not to try to make the sale, but let you do it. And so you just have to figure out how to use this tool properly. Um, and in B2B, um, there's no difference between selling, I don't know, fidget spinners, underwear, dog food, or software, or anything else. Because at the end of the day, all you're trying to do is have a stranger that doesn't know your brand think about you when they want to solve their problem. And LinkedIn is great because that's all who's there. I guess that's the idea, but it's just so inefficient. Like it's like you could have the world's strongest person to pull a bus, but if you had a hundred other people, they don't even have to be that strong. They're going to pull that bus a lot faster, right? Okay. Yeah. I'll take that every day. Yeah, and, and then there is an added advantage, the intangible that you get, uh, you know, that all the exposure, all the awareness that you generate, like you said, that person might just visit your website and you may not even know that uh, it was your social media ads that led to it. Uh, but it's the cumulative effect yeah. that everything sort of works together. Uh, yeah, no, I absolutely. I think you have it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, cool. So uh, I think... Um, I shall end this conversation now, and I want to, uh, you know, thank you from the bottom of my of, of my heart. It was it was a really good conversation, and uh, we really hit the nail on some points there. Uh, and I'm sure that the people listening to this uh, podcast or this episode will definitely benefit from it. So tell me a little bit about where people can reach you at. How can they benefit from what you offer? Where should they visit? You have something special that you can offer to my listeners. That would be awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so where you can find me is I'm on all the socials. My site is facebookdisruptor.com. Okay. Um, I'm building Disruptor School. It's coming soon. So I'll mm -hmm. be having email and SEO and TikTok and all of those fun things. But right now it's facebookdisruptor.com. Okay. And from there, you can find my YouTube, my TikTok, my Pinterest, my Facebook, my Instagram my Twitter, all that stuff from there. Um, and you can find whatever it is that you need from that. I, I highly encourage people to follow and to ask questions. Um, challenge me on things as much as you can. Um, I thoroughly enjoy getting my opinions challenged because sometimes I'm wrong. I can't tell you how many times somebody that didn't know what they were supposed to do approached the problem in a way that they weren't supposed to do it and came up with a solution better than everybody else that knew what they were supposed to do. I've been taught so many things by people that just didn't know any better, um, which is great. And I try to get better every day. And so that would be awesome. Um, you know, uh, my big thing that I'm doing more than anything now is I have a monthly webinar on how to master Facebook ads, which you can sign up for at apply.facebookdisruptor.com. Grab a seat um, to the next one. I'm running them fairly often. Um, and I would love for that. And um, one of the things I give away in that uh, webinar is uh, an ebook bundle on my Scrum Doc, which is how I track results. 
Um, and yeah, if anybody that's watching this, hears this and wants that, I'll just give it to them too. I think it'd be really helpful if they watch the webinar so they get some more context behind it, how to use it. But if you don't want to watch the webinar, you can always just search on YouTube and find literally hours and hours of video of me describing how I track information. Because at the end of the day, attribution doesn't matter. And iOS 14 isn't the reason that things are struggling for you. It's about understanding your numbers. And so the easiest thing I can do to help people that aren't good at numbers is by giving them the roadmap to use numbers to think for them. And so that's sort of my like, I'll, I'll gladly give that to anybody that, that wants it because it's helpful. And honestly, it's been on my Patreon for five years. I'll give that thing away. I don't care. Like it's been available forever. Um, and it's what I've taken from very big brands. I mean, to be honest, it comes from old bosses of mine from Guthy Banker, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, infomercial company like Ginsu Knives and Proactive, you know, uh, skincare and stuff. Um, and then also brands like Textile that run like uh, uh, FabFitFun and all of those things and from uh, the Match Group, you know, Match.com and all of their dating sites. How they all track data, I basically took it all together and made something that's free and easy. And it's what I've been using for five years so that I can understand everything that I need to at a glance and not have to work that hard. Because at the end of the day, you should enjoy life more than you're working. Like I, I just want people to be happier. And nice. if you can, uh, if you can make that happen for yourself, why not? So that's that's the best I can do. You know, if I was a better salesman or a hard push type of person, I'd have some freebie on a stick that was just the front end to some sales funnel to get you down to spend money. But look, if you want to work with me, you're more than welcome to. I'm not cheap, but I have a lot of free material everywhere. So I highly suggest you devour all of it and see if you actually trust me. At the end of the day, I'm some stranger on the internet. But if it works for you and you want more help, I can help people out in a lot of different ways, um, whether it's the most expensive route or something that's, you know, a couple bucks a day. So I'm here to help people out. And, and I really appreciate this time from you. I could do, I could talk about Facebook ads five hours. I've already talked about it for probably four or five hours today. And I'm not that tired. Like I could do it forever. Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity to try to tell other folks, if I had to leave with anything, it's the opportunity to tell folks, number one, Facebook isn't broken. Number two, you can absolutely do this. I talk to hundreds of people, thousands of people around the world, and everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing, I think, is that if you apply yourself in this way, you can change your life. And if you're entrepreneurial, the opportunity is full. I've helped people all over the world. And I just want people to know that they can. They haven't missed the boat. It's not broken. You're not late. Um, it's just going to be a little bit harder for you if you're not doing it the right way. But if you do it the right way, it's actually pretty easy. So I try to tell people the easy way. <laughs> yeah, what sounds easy, it, it takes a lot of, you know, understanding the complexity to get at the far end of the complexity and then be simple. So what is simple is not yeah. necessarily, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort to get to that simplicity. And, and that's what expertise is all about. Yes. And um, so thank you. I, I really appreciate your time and your coming on my podcast show and uh, super, super insightful conversation. And I really, really enjoyed connecting with you. And I hope to stay in touch with you going forward. We will meet uh, each other on Instagram as well. Maybe we'll do a live together sometime. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm, I'm always down for a live, you know? Uh, yeah. I'm always down for a live. I'm always down to, if you have people that want to ask a question Maybe you got five or 10 people. I'm always down for that, um, especially when it's coming up time for a new webinar. I always try to be on camera as much as possible. So just be selfishly try to get people into my thing. Uh, so I'm always game, always, you know, um, if you ask and we can provide help for people, um, why not? If I don't have anything else to do, I might as well help people be happy. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to end the recording for this call now. So. Sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it useful. Your support and feedback is invaluable. So please don't forget to like, follow and subscribe for more such business growth hacks. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn and Facebook. See you soon.